Okay, it's time to have another little talk here. This one here is uh, sort of a touching on recovering neglected rides. When I drive around uh, the town where I live here, and you probably noticed it too, you see all kinds of vehicles that are just parked that will never move again. Um, and I always wonder why they were parked. You know, uh, whenever I used to drive over to the you know, my, I worked about 30 miles to the west of here when I was working and teaching at a college. And there was a farmhouse I went by out there. There's a little small brick house that was surrounded by a lot of farmland. The guy had tractors and stuff, and I know he has, had, a, had a farm. But there was, uh, and this was back, I started noticing, in, you know, between 2000 and 2010, uh, there was a dark blue uh, Chevy Silverado that looked like it was about a 2000 or 2001 model. It was the new body style, you know, it had the 5.3 engine and those in it, 485.360. And it was sitting out there next to his house in the weeds. And I kept noticing that truck, it was just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And, and every time you I went by, there was a little bit more road up. And the last time I went by there, there had been, that truck was still in the same spot. And it had, had so much weeds and stuff grown up around it that you couldn't even tell there was a truck there anymore. Uh, but I found myself wondering, you know, that truck was parked when it wasn't very old. Well, across the road uh, from that, and, and slightly before you get to that house, uh, there was a house that was uh, looked like it was a sort of a vacant brick house. It looked like it was a nice house when it was built, but the yard was getting all grown up and everything. And there was like a 2006 Explorer sitting in the front yard of that one. And it sat there for a long time. And I was wondering, you know, I wonder if the engine's blown up or they just don't have a good title to it or what the deal is on that. I always, I just wonder about that kind of stuff. And I wondered about it most of my life. <laughs> I remember one time my uncle, uh, and he's long gone now. He probably died 20 years ago. But uh, in Alabama, and I mentioned this in my previous uh, PowerPoint, you didn't even have to have a title for a car before 1975. In Alabama now, if a car is more than 25 years old, you don't have to have a title for it for it to change hands. Uh, but a lot, most people still do, you know, if they if it's newer than 75. Uh, but the point is, uh, he lived out there on a U.S. highway, and um, there was a it wasn't a four lane; it was just a two lane U.S. highway back in those days. And there was a 55 Chevrolet truck that turned up out there, sitting beside the road. Somebody just abandoned for whatever reason. It wasn't very far from his house. And so he called the uh, sheriff and he said, hey, can I drag that thing off the road because I'm afraid somebody's going to run into it. And the sheriff said, yeah, I don't care, you know, whatever. And I remember it's a 55 model. And the truck had four, the tires weren't flat or anything, so he dragged it, you know, uh, back up into his yard. And uh, he tinkered with it and he figured out what was wrong with it and he fixed it and somebody came along and he sold it for $75. <laughs> Which, which was really funny. It sounds just like my uncle, but uh, I guess whoever was driving the truck that abandoned it didn't care anyway, you know. But since you didn't have a, have a title, that 64 uh, Chevrolet truck that I bought, this one right here, you know, I, I may have mentioned it before, but there was a, a guy that I used to do a little carpenter work for. I mean, he actually was a building contractor, and uh, I knew him. I grew up with his son. I knew him really well. And... Uh, this was a truck that he used around uh, his farm and sometimes on the job. And, and, I, and he, I went one day and I saw it sitting out there with a flat tire. And I said, uh, what are you doing with this truck that's sitting out there next to that shed with a flat tire? He said, well, it was running when I parked it. Uh, it just needs some air put in a tire and a battery and it, it'd be all right. And uh, so uh, now you got to remember this was like in the mid-70s. And I said, would you sell it to me for, um, I think this might have been 19... 76 or 77, I don't remember, 75, 74, sometime in there. I bought it from him for $150, and I drove to the courthouse here in town, and I says, uh, uh, I just bought a, uh, a 64 Chevrolet pickup truck that uh, hasn't had a tag on it for the last two or three years, and I need to go ahead and, you know, I, I aired it up and put a battery in it and drove it away from there. I mean, it fired up and ran perfectly, you know. So, three on the tree, you know, straight six. And I took it up there and the courthouse says, what's the, light, what's the serial number? You know, they didn't even go out and look at the truck. I gave them the serial number and they fixed me up a tag and a tag receipt for it. And go, ta-da, you know, 
And I drove it for a while, and I sold it to somebody for a couple hundred bucks. I mean, I think I made about fifty dollars on the deal. But that was that was one of them. But that was one of those vehicles that was running when it was parked. And I don't know how many of these vehicles I see. I see Mercedes. I see Toyotas. You name the make, I don't care. I've seen them sitting where it looks like somebody just parked them, got out, walked away, and decided they weren't going to drive them anymore. And they're sitting in people's yards, you know, pick up. I mean, I'm talking about Cadillacs, uh, SUVs, anything, that, any kind of uh, vehicle you could think about. And you see vehicles sitting beside the road, like, a, you know, I saw an old Volkswagen bug sitting beside the road a while back that would look like it was abandoned. It was just sitting there and nobody was doing anything with it. It was probably a 68 or 69 model. And I was thinking, my goodness, you know, a lot of people would just love to grab that and fix it up and sell it for $3,000 or something, you know. But anyway, that same uh, family, uh, the, the guy that I grew up with, I, I, was, I, had gone to, I was doing fleet maintenance in Texas a few years later. And I came back down, you know, off, I was on the coast down there, Sabine Pass. And I came back and I noticed this 73 LTD that was a really nice car when he bought it was sitting out there behind his house under the pecan trees. And I says, what's going on with this LTD? You know, why is it sitting there? Is there something wrong with it? And he said, well, it was running when I parked it. Same song, second verse. And he said, all it needs is a battery, so I put a battery in it. And I said, i tell you what I'll do. I said, I will fix this car and get it running, and uh, you pay for the parts. And for the labor of fixing it and getting it running, because he was said he was going to call the junk man and let them come get it. Now, this was in like 78 or 79. And he says, uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, he said, I'll give you, I said, you give me 40% of what you sell it for, and I'll fix it and get it going. And so uh, he was going to sell it to the junk man for like $100. But I put points and plugs in that thing, which he paid for them, and that thing fired up and ran like a brand new car. There was nothing wrong with it. Uh, but it had been sitting under the pecan trees, you know, it needed to be washed, you know, how pecan trees put that black dusty stuff all over the thing. And so we made sure that the tires were aired up and all that. Uh, this same guy, in, in the same house he was living in, you know, he was already married by that time and I was living in what had been his grandmother's house. And uh, I there was there whenever I was probably 15 years old. Uh, they rolled his, his grandmother had passed away. And we rolled a 53 Ford that she had owned out of her garage and had been sitting up for two or three years. And it's amazing to me that this gas didn't go bad, you know, and, and that these vehicles would start and run because bad gas will keep a vehicle from starting and running. Um, I guess it may be worse on some than others. But the point is, we uh, pushed that thing down the road and it fired up. You know, we had the key to it and it fired up and ran. I mean, and it just boggled my mind, you know, that these cars are that somebody could be using that aren't in that bad of shape, uh, that are, you know, in still good shape. Uh, but anyway, that particular car there, uh, he sold it for $300, and I uh, realized $140 cash profit off of that deal, just because I got it going for him and all. Now, this 2001 Impala was a cop car, it was a state trooper sleeper car, and the, uh, the fixed operations manager, I mean the, uh, excuse me, auxiliary services guy came to me and he knew these people and they said that it was an 01 model and they thought there was something wrong with the pass lock part of it. You know, the, hey, the, hey, you always got to put an ignition switch on these darn things whenever they get to where they won't start and all that. And um, because of the anti-theft, you know, go crappy and all that. And they had replaced the battery, but the thing still wouldn't start. And so I had it in the shop there and we were you know, you're just kind of tinkering with it. They don't spend a lot of money on it, so I wonder if we'd look at it at school, you know. And so I we got a, did a voltage drop test between the battery, which is a little annoying to do on a side post battery. This had a side post battery. If you just glanced at the terminals where they were connected to the battery, you know, they looked okay. Uh, but, I, you know, and it's an, it's an iffy thing to you do your voltage drop test from the bolt that holds the battery terminal to the end of the side of the battery down to the starter. You, do, you can't always get a good reading like that because there's too many connections in there. Um, in other words, you're not, the best connection you're going to get is directly to the battery, but it's the closest thing you can hook up to the battery on those with that rubbery cover over that side post is on that pole, unless you work your probe down in there in between there and go right into the lid there, that's part of the battery. Anyway, we were dropping seven volts 
on the positive side when we tried to start it and it wouldn't start. And so we found this. Whenever they put the battery in there, nobody even looked at that. And, and that uh, crappy looking uh, chalky stuff on there, I actually got a, a replacement side post battery terminal and I did some solder splicing and all that. And I put up a brand new battery terminal on there. I think that whole job because we didn't charge any labor to charge for the parts cost the uh, the uh, highway patrol outfit like 16 or 17 bucks or something like that, you know. So anyway, we got that one going and all it needed was that battery terminal. See, the thing about it is when that thing was hooked up to the battery, you could not look at this and nobody apparently looked in here at that whenever they were doing the battery swap. They didn't flip that cable over and look at it. They just bolted it to the battery and felt like it'd be a eight. You know, this book up, but it was a whole bunch of chalky stuff that was trapped up in this red rubber. I actually cut, when I cut that thing off of there and replaced it with a new cable and all that, I went ahead and saved that, you know, just so I could show it to my students later on. Um, this uh, Expedition uh, came in with a flat air spring. Uh, that was one of those. and. Uh, uh, the one on the right had been replaced right before it was parked. We sold them on replacing a rear suspension with coil springs and that come with a full set of shocks. You know, there's a kit for a couple of hundred bucks, but that's how much it was whenever we did this. As you can buy for Lincolns, Crown Victorias, if they got flat air springs on them and, you know, you got issues with that, you know, those air springs just love to leak. And, you know, and whenever the air, uh, airbag springs start leaking and all, you end up uh, with issues anyway. So. On well, my dad's grand marquee, they started leaking down and going flat. You know, you crank it up and the air compressor would kick on and pump them back up. But then when you parked it, they'd leak out and go flat again. And the ones with four airbags, you know, like some of the Continental stuff, they were more annoying. But on this particular one, I bought, uh, you know, talked to this guy into letting us just replace the shocks and the springs. In other words, got them airbags are easy to take out of there and replace with regular springs and it levels the thing back up and you don't ever have any trouble with it. Now I will tell you that the ride height sensor, if you don't adjust it right, it's going to have an idea there's some kind of a problem with the air suspension uh, anyway. And furthermore, unless you plug the solenoids in and let them swing from the wires and you know the solenoids that let the air pump in and out of the, of the air springs are going to have air, you know, air suspension light on all the time anyway. But you know, uh, that's the way it is on my dad's uh, grand marquee. I didn't leave those plugged in and just, you know, got rid of them, airbags and all. And so uh, there's, that does away with that airbag problem. It doesn't cost all that much to do it. It's not all that hard to do, except putting shock absorbers on a Grand Marquis or a Crown Victoria can be a little bit aggravating because of where the top shocks are up. All right, this one here was a barn find. This, these people here always kept this vehicle parked uh, in a barn for some reason or had left it in a barn for a long time. And... Uh, the guy uh, and his wife were tinkering with it and it was like a 97 model 626. And I have actually talked about this one before. It had a very strange starter issue. The starter was burned up on it. He put another starter on it that was used. That starter, um, I can't remember. That starter seemed like that starter burned up too. Um, and um, anyway, one way or another, we had to put another starter on it. But the stupid thing wouldn't start, and when we pull the gas tank off, you know, you can smell that the gas when you got a little bit of a of a uh, sample of the gas. You know, you get it on your fingers and smell of it. You can tell it really, really stinks. And we had to pull the gas tank off and clean it out and replace the fuel pump. And it's not a bad idea to flush those lines out. And sometimes you'll have clogged up fuel injectors uh, because of one sitting in a you know barn for a long time too. And so that's how we managed to get this one here going again. We eventually had to put a coil on it too because the coil got weak and it was sputtering and popping and cutting up. We did one job after another on this car until we finally got it straightened out. Um, but anyway, uh, that's the deal on that one. Uh, now these spark plugs right here, anybody that's ever fought with these spark plugs, a lot of people are, you know, kind of, uh, they have do all, they run through all kind of gyrations of heating them up and pouring, you know, they start them, screwing them out just a little bit and then they pour some carbon softening chemical down there and all that kind of thing and if the if that crimp rolls and this shell comes off then you got to use that special tool right there to get it out of there and that's a sort of a drag and uh, so basically what we wound up doing and I've talked about this before and I actually posted this photo on my, uh, one of my you know Facebook pages where I talked to a lot of mechanics and stuff 
And, you know, and I said, we jerked them out with an impact wrench, and when we jerk them out with an impact wrench, we don't ever have one to come apart. Uh, you know, that sounds kind of scary, but this one guy, uh, he verified what I was talking about. He said, uh, we use uh, impact wrenches with all manner of wigglers and stuff like that, and uh, we snatch them out of there, and he said, every single time we get them all out of there, we've done 20 or 30 of them now, and they come out perfectly. And he said, before that, it was a 50-50 crapshoot. About half of them, when you screwed them out of there, you know, you'd groan because they'd come out and they, well, they left a little shell down in there and yeah, that kind of thing. But now I will say, I don't particularly care for Champion spark plugs, but bless their heart, Champion has come up with spark plugs for these three valve uh, five, four inches that the, the shell is all made together so that there's no way it can come apart. Uh, and that's a pretty good thing. But if you screw these out of here slowly, it gives that thing plenty of time to roll that crimp back and leave that shell down in there, and it's an absolute pain. Uh, but anyway, we solved, started solving all the front. Now, I will say, I didn't come up with this impact wrench problem. The guy at the local parts store said that there was a, another part, another uh, shop that was across town that he sold parts to that was jerking these out with an impact wrench, and they said it worked really good. So. I figured we'd try that because we had absolutely nothing to lose. Um, this is a little, uh, the president of the college, one of the presidents of the college, uh, had an 8N Ford tractor. And he came over there to see me one day and he says, do you have somebody you can send out here? My tractor has quit out in the field. And so uh, he went out there. I sent this one boy that I had. was a really good troubleshooter out there. And he was a young fellow too. He went out there and the president of the college went out there with him. And what he found out was that where the wire goes through the distributor housing, it was shortened out, the wire going to the points. And that was, you know, causing problems. So he got a piece of the antifreeze jug, and he made a little uh, grommet, you know, to keep that thing from touching ground and fix the tractor where it would run and all that. And then the president of the college brought the tractor over there, and he says, uh, see what you can do about uh, giving this thing a good tune-up. And so I said, yeah, we can do that. So I ordered the distributor cap, and the, plug wires and spark plugs and all that kind of thing, and points and condensers. I jerked all that stuff out of there, threw it on the ground over there, and I said, wait a minute. As in, this was before internet. Um, I said, I don't know what the firing order is on this thing. And it's not the same, or I don't know that it's the same as a plain old, you know, 1342 like on a regular four-cylinder straight line. It was a flathead. And so I put my fingers in each one of the spark plug holes. And I cut, you know, I had a finger in each hole, this holding it over each hole. And I had to get the student that was working with me spin it over. And I felt the compression puffs, puff, 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 puff. And I figured out the fire order that way. Put it all back together. And whenever we got it all set up and the time had set on everything, that thing ran so good that he said, you know, I was going to sell this tractor, but it runs so good now, I just hate to sell it. Um, but when I was a young teenager, I drove a tractor like this all over the country, and it was a really cool ride. This right here was something that was pretty darn spooky, um, how the, these Accord brakes wound up in such horrible shape. Um, and that doesn't really look all that bad until you notice the fact that there's no brake pad left, not even the backing plate. The only thing that's left is that silencer. Uh, and that was on an old Honda. This is actually the old Honda I had in my previous video that got knocked off the lift, okay? But I got pictures of the brakes the way these things were. Uh, it had already pushed this piston so far out where, where those worn out brakes that it was leaking fluid around there. I mean, the piston was just about to come completely out of there. And this is where it had the shavings and see how what was left of one of the pads, you know, was actually scrubbing on that thing. Drove this thing until it absolutely wouldn't stop anymore. And uh, that, the way that they, this is how they maintain the thing. And that's why whenever I call the lady and I say, hey, we had a little accident. The thing got knocked off lift and kind of bent the fender a little bit. That's all it did, you know. The arm locks on that bin pack lift did a terrific job of not letting them, you know, the arm move. And, uh, and what had happened was the, the arm went up in the wheel well and all. But anyway, she said, I don't care. She has my extra car anyway. And I couldn't care less about a dent in the fender. Just, you know, as long as the drives run, starts all right. And if a tire don't scrub on the fender when you turn the wheel, I don't give a rip, you know. You know, she was very, very understanding about that. Uh, but 
Here's got these people, you know these people that use JB Weld, I mean they feel like, you know, you can, uh, you hear all these crazy stories about JB Weld, about how somebody, you know, I built a piston out of JB Weld and I cut ring grooves in it and I put it in there and I drove the engine and drove it for 100,000 miles. <laughs> I mean, wacky stories like that about stuff people have done with JB Weld. I'm not here to trash JB Weld, it has its place naturally, but some people think of like, if a little JB Weld didn't work, a lot will be better. I think I've shown this picture one time before, but it's always really something to me. You know, and we had to chip all of that JB weld out of there, and then this broken off. Uh, they JB welded that heater hose outlet on there, which was, you know, right down in this area, because they, <clears throat> you know, it obviously started leaking. You can see all that rusty crud everywhere back there where it had been blowing rusty water all over the place. And so basically what we did, we chipped all that out of there, and we went in there with a tight, with a pipe tap, and I think it's a half inch pipe tap, I remember right, but anyway, we went in there and we put a fitting in there and we fixed that one, you know. And so, now, along those same lines, on a Nissan Pathfinder, if you're familiar with this wacky $200 hose, it's got that electric uh, water pump on it that helps circulate water through the heater core. Um, I actually was going to make a little coolant filling uh, tank on that, you know, by having a little hose uh, that I could, you know, with a little uh, thing. It looks like a blower, but it's got a, a rubber elbow on it that you put cool, I mean, uh, put water in and uh, radiator in. I was going to use that right there along with this tank to build me uh, something that I could roll around on wheels and I could have a mix of antifreeze in it where I could just, you know, fill up stuff with it. Never got around to do finishing that job. But what happened here <clears throat> was when the guy was putting the heater core in this thing in the midst of all the other work that he was doing, uh, he managed to uh, break this darn thing off right here. Well, excuse me, he broke it off here. Uh, and when we, when we pop that off. Now, you could replace this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. And we have actually done that on some other ones. But in this particular case, you know, whenever he popped it off, I decided, I, was, I got this tap. I said, you know, that's pretty beefy right there. It's got a lot of plastic. And so I, I, I told the guy that owned it, who was a real good friend of mine, I said, we're going to try this to see if it works, you know. And if he leaks any coolant, you need to be paying close attention to it. And he says, hey, let's go for it. And so I used this pipe tap. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's a half-inch pipe tap, too. And I screwed it up in there. And I've cut some really, really good threads in that plastic. And that plastic's really tough. Um, you can see basically how, you see how this small hose comes off and this is coming in. This is basically the one right here that we did. See so that one right there. This one actually goes into the heater core right here. But anyway... We cut that, that's what we did, and then we screwed this fitting in there that we got from the parts store along with some Teflon tape. And this, there was plenty of beefy plastic right here, and that fix worked pretty darn good. As far as I know, he is still driving his vehicle, and that's been several years ago. I mean, you know, probably five, four, five, six years ago. And that, that was basically a fix. The right way to do it and I would have been to replace this whole assembly. And, and we, like I say, we've done that on some other Pathfinders. But on this particular one, we decided to go with the, you know, do a little patch job there. Now, this Tempo basket case was one that probably should have been parked, and the car probably wasn't worth, I don't know, $200 driving down the road, or if you parked it beside the road and put a for sale sign on it, it might be worth a couple hundred bucks. She was hearing a popping noise, pop, 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 whenever she would back up. When she went forward, she didn't hear it. Well, what the deal was, the final drive, you know, you can see that, uh, governor driving, I mean, this little wheel here drives the speedometer uh, and, the, and the governor, you know, they're, both of them are driven by that. And so, anyway, it, some of these balls had come out of here and they had fallen into the pan and one of them had worked its way back into that spot right there, that ball head, and that uh, ring gear was actually working against that ball and it was making that pan oil can ding, 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 every time these teeth but it, that thing had beat a dimple into that pan where that ball was always staying in that same spot and whenever you put it in reverse this would do that you see there's your uh, there's where your uh, that gear drives your governor there was a vehicle now that I've, I've seen that I'm thinking about uh, whenever I was working at Lincoln uh, Mercury place back in 84 there was a, a nearly a brand spanking new Ford Escort had the same transaxle in it, and uh, that thing uh, wouldn't shift, just absolutely wouldn't shift. And so I pulled the 
Uh, I said, well, if it won't shift, and it wasn't an electronic transmission, it was all hydraulic. And it had a governor in it that spins like the governor on OGM, you know. And, it, and that plastic gear right there was what spun that governor. Uh, well, what I didn't realize at the time, that plastic gear has got those little ears on it that are where it's supposed to, when everything's put together, it's supposed to be pinched between this boss and that bearing, and that's not supposed to move. And it's supposed to drive your speedometer, and the other side of it drives your governor. Well, uh, the governor, you know, spins, and it's got these fly weights, and they move the valve in the middle of it. But because they wouldn't shift, I pull the governor out, and I just glanced at it. I said, I don't really see anything wrong with that. If I'd have felt of that little gear on the bottom of the governor, which is about as big around as your finger, I would have felt a little, you know, where it had worn out, uh, where this was spinning there, and it wasn't driving the governor anymore, and because this gear had become loose. And so I just popped another governor in it, and of course it had a nice new gear, and I drove it, it shifted out good. Came back about a week later, do you like it was, do you like it was? And so on that particular one, I realized when I pull that pan off, you can see all this. Now the valve body on this transaxle is on the top, but on the bottom you see the ring gear and pinion and all that stuff up in there. And, you know, your park, Paul. Anyway, the long and the short of it is uh, I had to take this bearing housing out, which has got bolts in there, and take it out of there, and I had to pull the uh, differential out of it. I figured out a way to do that without pulling the transaxle out of the car. I managed to make that happen and pull the CV axle out and all that. And that was a six hour flag and I managed to do it about an hour and a half. But when I put that new plastic gear in there, I actually got some brass shim stock and I put around there and bent the tabs up on it that I cut it special where it would come out to make it even tighter where that wouldn't happen again. Why it failed the first time, I'm not exactly sure, but when I saw the, looked up in this transaxle, I remembered that, that having run into that. Anyway, when we got through with this, and I, I was, we found the engine knocking, and I've mentioned this on a previous video, and that's one where we pull the pan off and we, you know, pull the uh, rod bearings off and push it away, and we mic'd the uh, crankshaft, and it was absolutely within specs, and so we just put a, a set of standard bearings back in there, took care of that knock. While her transmission was working better, her engine knock was gone, and she got out. We had to put a replacement transmission in it, you know, with a junkyard unit. And when we put all of that back together, and that thing ran and drove really good. It was like a 92 or 3 mile or something, uh, something like that. Uh, but that thing ran really good, and I heard it running, boom, boom, it ran smooth as silk. And the girl that owned it, I saw her one day, and I said, how's your car doing for you? And she made the snide remark. She said, I liked it better before y'all worked on it. Well, I don't know what she liked about it because the thing was knocking and it was making a horrible racket when you put it in transmission reverse back up. Wasn't doing any of that. After that, I don't know what her deal was. And we actually, you know, did a lot of good work on that car for not much money. This is a barn truck I talked about one time before that I thought was interesting. It's Silverado. And this right here, in order to get a picture of that fuse blowing, you know, that fuse would actually pop. Uh, and then, you know, of course, you're, um, on this particular one, GM went with electronic throttle bodies before Ford did. Ford waited until a processor was developed, the Black Oak processor, I guess, that was fast enough to handle the electronic throttle bodies. Well, GM replaced the cruise control module with a little module that was just, that would communicate with the PCM, but it was just for operating the throttle body. That's how this was set up. But it would pop that fuse every time you turned around that was feeding that electronic throttle body and it wouldn't do anything but idle. The electronic throttle body would work. This is the schematic, or at least part of it. You might notice there's a lot more if you've got a dotted line around a box or more to it than what you're seeing here. But this was a pertinent part of it. When I was looking at this, there's B plus going in on that pin right there. There's ground right here. The only other ground that we showed was coming through the uh, center high mount stoplight bulbs, that had nothing to do with this. Because when you put power there, it would fire up those, those center high mount stoplights. And so uh, basically what you got here, your throttle body here has got a couple of pots on it, and it's got a little motor that drives it, you know, back and forth. Always remember when you're looking at these electronic throttle bodies, that this thing, not only, you're thinking, well, uh, the uh, motor drives it open and the spring closes the plate. Well, that's not the way it is. It is driven closed and open. And if you ever happen to have your finger in there, uh, whenever somebody lets their foot off the gas with the key on, like, like they'll turn on the gas, don't even turn on the key, don't even start it. 
push the gas pedal to the floor, it'll open that throttle plate. All right, you may be working in there with your finger or something. If your buddy gets distracted and he takes his foot off of that gas pedal, that throttle plate will cut your finger off. I mean, you do not want to have your finger in there. If you're ever cleaning the throttle body, and don't open that plate with your finger either because you'll mess up some of the throttle bodies, particularly on vehicles like Nissan's, I think, or some of Asian ones. If you open it by hand, you'll ruin it. Always have somebody open it by mashing the gas pedal. Don't ever put your finger in there. Always make sure that you're washing it out with a toothbrush and some stuff so that if he lets go of it, it may cut the head off the toothbrush, uh, but it won't cut off your finger, you know. Uh, anyway, this buddy of mine opened one with his finger on one of those Asian cars, and I don't remember the make, and he said he wound up having to buy a throttle body for it because it never would work after that. Um, anyway, that uh, barn truck popped that fuse, and I said, I need to find out why the fuse is popping. This module right here is mounted right over in this area on the driver's side where the cruise control module used to be mounted. And I took it apart, and I didn't see anything, you know, basically. Uh, and so what I managed to do, whenever I took it uh, apart, you know, with the cover off of it and everything, that is, you know, I always like to do that because I enjoy looking at that stuff one way or another just to see if I can see anything. Uh, but what we wound up doing on that one was we got a, and this is the salvage yard unit that we put on there, right here. And yeah, because it's had that grease, you know, that paint on it and everything. And we put that on there. There wasn't anything we had to program or anything. We just put it on there and went to town. Uh, everything was fine. Um, but one way or another, this cobalt was one that had been sitting in a barn and somebody had dolled this thing up and put fancy paint on it. It used to have fancy wheels on it, but somebody had took the fancy wheels off and just had to, you know, plain old black rims back on there. And it had 48,000 miles on it and this girl that was, uh, went to the college out there, she, her and her, uh, boyfriend, uh, went and looked at this thing and it was a, it was an 05 Chevy Cobalt. She paid a thousand dollars for it, uh, but it usually wouldn't start and if it did start, you know, it, it didn't run good and all that stuff. There was all kinds of issues with the darn thing and furthermore the power steering didn't work and it had a power steering uh, warning up going across there. And so the first thing we found out was a fuel pump written one and this is a fuel pump relay. And what was funny about that, the way this is fixed, if somebody plugs this in, so they, you can plug that fuel pump relay in on this cobalt over to the side so that two of the pins aren't even in the right place. <laughs> and somebody had plugged this in wrong. Uh, but what we typically do, and I've talked about that before, we pull the fuel pump relay and we get on the wire going out to the fuel pump, check it for ground. If, whenever the fuel pump relay is energized, you ought to, you know, if, if they the system is trying to energize as you pull the relay you should have two powers and two grounds there one ground is going to be coming back through your pump unless there is a module that's driving the pump you know so you may like on some of the vehicles that have a, a fuel pump control module you may not see a ground on the one going out of the pump because it's not going directly to the pump this one was going directly to the pump all right so when we put the relay back in there the right way it still wouldn't start we put a scan tool on it. We didn't have no communication. When we did have communication, we got a lot of codes, network code mostly, but they went away all by themselves one at a time the more we fooled with this thing. We had to fix a few wires there by the headlight, but that wasn't all that. I mean, that wasn't anything to do with the network. It's interesting to me how after this thing had been parked, it developed all these problems. And it may have been because of the power steering failure that they parked it. I don't know. All right, so we turned the key on finally, and the security light went off, and the car fired up. So we had good communication from everything except the transmission control module and the power steering control module, which the power steering control module was dead in the water, and it had to be replaced. Uh, but we didn't do it. We sent it to the dealer because it was covered under a recall program. Uh, and the transmission wouldn't shift. The speedometer was a flatliner, so we focused on the transmission control module. So we looked at the PCM data stream and we were, that we were able to access. We could talk to this module. We found some fuel trim issues and we found split hoses and stuff like you would expect to see. Now there had been some modifications done to the fuel system, you know, different throttle body, different injectors, this kind of stuff. Whoever did this, you know, you know we figured they were going to make that their specific personal ride. And that's the way a lot of people do with stuff like this. 
and they wind up making it so that it's uh, not worth as much and it's not drivable, you know, I mean, a lot of the time. But of course, you know, if somebody does it smartly and they do it the right way, you know. I remember this one guy bought a brand spanking new Mustang and absolutely the first thing he did was he went and replaced the throttle body and some of the other parts and different injectors and then he started getting check engine lights and he wanted us to fix that. You know, after he done all his modifications, he threw a bunch of check engine lights because of the modifications he made and then he wanted it fixed under warranty at the Ford place. Well, we ran him off. The power steering was dead, but there was a GM recall program on it. That was the number for the recall program. And that took care of that problem. She had to actually take it over to get that done. Well, we checked the powers and grounds on the TCM chasing a PO604A. Now, that PO604A can actually mean that the TCM or the PCM is non-communicative. And so you got to be careful on that. And we decided to get a $100 used transmission control module, and that did the job. Now, I will tell you that when we were measuring the vehicle speed sensor here, um, seems to me like it was supposed to be 1,700 ohms, and we measured 1,000 there. But that wouldn't keep it from communicating, and so that's why we went ahead and went with this used transmission control module. That took care of the whole thing. Well, the end of that story was, this cobalt ran great after all the barn recovery work, and her warning lights were even gone, but the fuel economy was so horrible on this little car that she just got rid of it and got her something else. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of money on it, but we learned a heck of a lot working on it or anything. Uh, not the least of which is that it's like there were some kind of electronic cobwebs that worked their way out of all the modules after we started booting them up and shutting them down a bunch of times. <laughs> so a lot of those codes went away and everything was okay. But sitting in a barn does stuff to vehicles that have network issues on it. I also bought a 70 model Ford pickup one time that was sitting in a barn. It seemed like I paid 500 bucks for that one. and That was in 1995, I think. And I drove that thing for a while. I put a turn signal switch on it. And, uh, and, um, but what was funny to me was the guy that sold it to me, here's the, here's the thing. If somebody is selling a car, the first thing that if they say, I'm not a mechanic, I'm not a mechanic, that is them saying, I know it has a problem, but I'm not going to tell you about it. That's usually what that means. You know, they'll say, you know, they're, it's basically plausible deniability. If they're not a mechanic, they can't know there was anything wrong with it because they're not a mechanic. And so I told the guy, I said, well, I'm all right with that. You know, I was, I was driving it with him, you know. And uh, he says, uh, now I think it needs a U-joint, and the way you do that is, <laughs> he was telling me in detail how to change the U-joint, but after telling me that he wasn't a mechanic. Uh, but anyway, I wound up, I drove that one for a while, and I wound up selling it for uh, like 750 bucks or something like that, so I made a little money off that deal too. Uh, anyway, uh, until next time, I really appreciate you guys coming around. This uh, video is not quite as long or involved as some of them I've done, but I really enjoy the comments, and uh, Every now and then I'll get some uh, kind of a comment with a bunch of heebie-jeebie stuff, you know, from somebody, uh, you know, that has to, it actually gets bounced off as spam, but I'll get an email saying, hey, this is exactly what I needed, and then, you know, some uh, somebody trying to get me to click on a link to go look at dirty pictures or something, I always just blow those out of there. Anyway, uh, y'all come back to see me, and I'll be here next Monday.